Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex Wilson. I'll be riding solo dolo today as Anthony Rivardo is currently enjoying the luxuries of Disney World. Lucky for him, I'm stuck here in New York listening to sirens all day. However, we're here to talk Giants football as usual, and today's been an interesting day because the injury reports were a little optimistic on the offensive side and a little down on the, on the defensive side, and the reason is Blake Martinez suffered a back injury against the Seattle Seahawks. He missed the final series of the game, which closed it out for the Giants to secure the improbable 17-12 to victory. But nonetheless, you know, losing Martinez for the upcoming week, which is seeming to be a likelihood, um, is going to be a big deal for the Giants. And how do they supplement that? Well, it's going to be tough. And Patrick Graham, defensive coordinator, as you know, has been genius lately at figuring out what to do, how to scheme pressure, how to make sure his team is playing at the top of their game. But losing a guy like Martinez is pretty big, and I'll tell you why. Martinez has 111 tackles this year so far, six tackles for a loss, five quarterback hits, and two sacks. He's been one of the best defenders in the run game, he's been pretty good in coverage for the most part, and is one of the best tacklers in the NFL. I think he leads the league in stops, which is essentially a statistic to tell um, you know, stopping a runner before they gain at least 40% of the first yardage, uh, first down yardage. So he's been phenomenal against the run. He's one of the Giants' best defenders and one of the best free agent signings of this recent class. Um, and losing him would be significant, you know. And this is why they actually went out and they signed David Mayo to a multi-year deal. And if you don't remember David Mayo, he actually played uh, a lot last year in 2019 under Pat Shermer and James Betcher's defense. He actually started in 13 games. So that's a lot of action for David Mayo. He actually picked up two sacks as well, 82 combined tackles, uh, five tackles for a loss, two quarterback hits. He He's a pretty similar player to Blake Martinez in terms of stature and size. He's six foot two, 245, while Martinez is also six foot two um, and 237 pounds. So Mayo has a couple pounds on him. Um, but M Martinez actually lost a little bit of weight this year to get faster. And that was the whole purpose of his transition to this Giants defense, you know? Because when he was with Green Bay, he even stated before this season, before he actually signed with the Giants, that Green Bay did not use, like, utilize the linebacker spot, the middle linebacker spot appropriately. They didn't entirely value what Martinez brought to the team. Um, and the Giants, and specifically Patrick Graham, who has worked with him in the past with Green Bay, um, knows what knew what he had with Martinez, and he really decided that he would be a good fit in his scheme. And they play a very, very diverse scheme. And if you've watched the Seattle game, we did a ton of film breakdown um, on this game specifically, so go check it out if you haven't already. We broke down Carter Coughlin. Um, we met up with Brian Walker um, of uh, D-Backs Academy. He, he coaches uh, Darnay Holmes and Jabril Peppers, and he broke us down uh, pretty much the film from the game on what the secondary looked like, what the def what defense was doing, and the different alignments and coverage schemes that they were using. Really, really interesting. Go check it out on YouTube if you haven't checked it out already. And what they're going to do this week is pretty similar to what they did in Seattle, and and. What I mean by that is expect to see a lot of spies. Um, looking at Carter Coughlin specifically, he was used primarily as a spy uh, against Seattle. And that, and that worked very, very well because he's a 4.57 40-yard dash guy, right? He has 4.57. In 2018, his pass rush uh, win rate was in the upper echelon with you know Joey Bosa, Nick Bosa, and Chase Young. So a guy like that, you know, you want to be using him in a spy role. And Martinez is really the cleanup man. He's staying at the second level. He's monitoring what's going on. And if he sees any gaps, he shoots it. And that's kind of what we saw from Ryan Connolly last year, another player that I was kind of surprised they let go of. Uh, clearly, the injury was, was pretty significant if they were willing to part ways with him. Um, he hasn't really made much of an impact in Minnesota. So, you know, it says a lot about the injury. But... Martinez is a guy who they actually wanted to be more aggressive because in Green Bay, they really wanted him mitigating big plays. You know, he was staying at the back of the second level trying to stop those runners um, from breaking through and, and picking up chunk yardage, 20, 30, even 15 yards. And now they're saying, Blake, we want you to move up. We want you to be at the line of scrimmage a lot and really have, have a say in, you know, being aggressive. And it's worked to perfection for the Giants. He's been phenomenal. He's only making about $10 million per season. Um, which is a steal for a player uh, of this magnitude. And interestingly, I didn't even know this, but his his nickname is Boar. Pretty cool. He kind of has the Boar mentality, really aggressive um, in mitigating those big plays and really stuffing gaps. Um, but, you know, losing him for this week is going to be a big problem. And I think David Mayo is going to get most of the reps, if not Devontae Downs, um, who's a bigger linebacker, a little bit bigger than usual, uh, but can fill those gaps as well. He's not as fast and elusive and as aggressive as Martinez. But I think he might be able to get the job done, at least to some degree, especially because he's been getting some reps here and there. But David Mayo this season really hasn't played much at all. Um, I think he had, let's see, 
uh, in 2020, this year is 19 combined ta- uh, tackles. Only has one tackle for a loss. Really, really minimal action. You're only 12% of defensive snaps. Mainly a, a special teams guy. But you know, this is a week where they're looking to replace Blake Martinez if he's out, and it's looking, it's trending in that direction. You know, David Mayo can fit that role pretty well. But then again, you have to think, you know, Patrick Graham loves to do a lot of diverse and interesting things uh, with his defense. You know, the multiples, the 3-4, the 4-3 base concepts and schemes he's implementing and the quarterback spies that are rotating. So last week we saw a ton of different spies. And and this, this is really important, especially against mobile quarterbacks like, you know, Russell Wilson, of course. And then you have Kyler Murray, who's a very similar guy to him. Um, and, you know, when it comes to Kyler Murray, it's important to know a couple things. He's shorter. He's actually shorter than Russell Wilson. And throwing lanes are really big for short quarterbacks because if you're big, 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, um, you can look over the offensive line. You can look over pass rushers and, and, and target guys downfield. But if you're a smaller quarterback, you don't have those passing lanes to really, uh, you know, target those guys, see those guys. So you want to get bodies in front of them. And that was the whole concept of, you know, flush the offensive line out of the way get those A gaps and B gaps opened up. And then, you know, with the spies like Carter Coughlin, Tay Crowder, we saw Logan Ryan, we saw uh, Jabril Peppers a little bit, you know, Cam Brown a little bit here and there, even Blake Martinez. They were all rotating Xavier McKinney in the beginning of the game, which is really cool because they actually used him in the red zone, um, which is which is a very positive sign for McKinney if they're willing to trust him on the first drive of the game for Seattle in the red zone. Um, but expect to see some David Mayo and Devontae Downs, those two guys. Kind of, you know, maybe rotating in that in that middle linebacker spot because losing Martinez is a big deal. Um, but then you want to have Tay Crowder really pick up the slack because he's looked phenomenal lately. Tay Crowder, you know, Mr. Irrelevant, last pick in the draft. He's he's really stepped up, and you know, it very surprised me. And I'm I'm really happy that you know he's he's becoming a player that we can rely on week on week out as a rookie. Really, all the rookies this year have been have been really great. I mean, Nico Lalo just got bumped up to the active roster, and he's an undrafted free agent. Um, from Dartmouth, you know, th- these are guys who you don't expect to be bringing tons of value to the game at, for the Giants, and they are doing that. Um, but, you know, then leading us to the offensive side of the ball, a little bit more optimistic with Daniel Jones. He uh, essentially this this is the this is the deal with Daniel Jones. I don't think he's 100 percent healthy. I think he's about 60 percent to 75 percent healthy. Uh, watching his running in, in practice on some of these videos, it doesn't look great to me. You know, if they're playing hurry up offense. And he's expected to sprint down the field and get to line of scrimmage early and, and, and make sure that everyone's in alignment. He doesn't look like he has that full ability to run full speed right now. And especially because the Giants love to use him in that way. You know, they love to use him in the running game, the RPOs and the, the play action and rolling out uh, to the right side, like designed rollouts, um, designed RPOs and zone reads. These are these are things that Daniel Jones is good at. And taking that out of his game and making him a pure pocket passer is really not his game plan. It's not his style anymore. They've really started to develop this offense around him and what he's good at. So the question is, you know, is if he plays, can they expect him to do, you know, what he usually does? And I don't think that's the case. If he plays, I don't expect it to be a lot of running because think about this. You know, it's going to be cold. It's going to be damp on Sunday uh, for the game against the Cardinals. In MetLife, it's windy always. Uh, I, I personally, I'm worried about this injury acting up, maybe re-aggravating it, and then suddenly you don't have DJ. You know, you don't have DJ for the Cleveland game. You don't have DJ for the Baltimore game. And those those couple games right there, in my opinion, might even be more important because if you lose DJ and he's not 100% healthy and he goes down again, you know, you're in real trouble. So you got to make the calculated risk right now. If he is 75% healthy, which I think is his max right now, he's 75% healthy, because um, you know hamstrings. If you've ever had a hamstring injury, these things are lingering. They they nag. Um, they're easy to reaggravate, especially in, in in crappy weather. So, in my opinion, you know, if you take that calculated risk with uh, the injury here, you have to be okay with not using DJ against Cleveland. Okay with him not even being available for Baltimore. So, in my opinion. You sit him this week. Give him this extra week. The Giants just came off a huge win. Nobody thought was going to happen. You give him that extra week. You let Colt McCoy start. Hope the defense comes to play. And, uh, you know, you, you live to see another day because, DJ, I'm scared. Like, personally, I'm worried. This is an injury that could come back up and bite us in the butt if he if he pulls it again. Um, so, you know, be very careful. They are being careful. Joe Judge said there's still a long way to go from Saturday to Sunday. They are optimistic. Um, but, you know, keep it, you know, Listen with a grain of salt. You know, take things with a grain of salt right now because I'm not totally sure um, we can commit to DJ. You know, playing right now, so I'm sure they're they're working with both Colt and DJ at first string, um, just to make sure they have two game plans in place. 
nonetheless, um, we have a couple fan mailbag questions posted on Twitter. Um, you know, just wanted to get you guys involved as always. So one question, what have you thought about Caden Smith's performances here from Joseph Michael, one of our uh, very loyal followers? Shout out to Joseph. Um, I thought Caden Smith has been great this year, um, specifically in the run game. Evan Ingram's really, really, really developed in the run game, and that's kind of where he, why Caden Smith hasn't gotten all of these reps. Um, but if I'm looking at PFF right now, I know some people don't like their grading um, primarily, but you know I'm looking at it right now, and his run blocking is phenomenal. Caden Smith is, is one of the best on the team in terms of run blocking at the tight end position. Um, he doesn't really get too much action in the receiving game, but you know that that's okay because you have Evan Ingram. That's what he's there for. You know, you're really paying Evan Ingram. You're really keeping him around. Didn't trade him because of that playmaking ability in the receiving game. Um, you know, and he and he's actually been very, very, very good, very good um, at in run blocking the past couple of weeks. And you know, that's a credit to Freddie Kitchens. Freddie Kitchens, former head coach for Cleveland, coming over. And you know, I'm looking at Evan Ingram's you know stats for his career right now, and his run blocking has been terrible every season and this year he's taken a major step forward um from about week nine onwards he's had a grade of over 70 um uh, three of the four weeks so really really promising stuff with evan ingram here um caden smith you know I, I i like caden smith a lot i think he's a good chunk yardage guy get a couple yards here and there you know kind of a hook route stick route type of player um you know get those first downs big body like jason Wynn, like jason garrett likes uh, but Evan Ingram, man, he's polarizing. You know, one one second he's dropping footballs, this, the next moment he's making one handy catches. You know, it, he's the most interesting player I've ever seen. Uh, personally, I don't get him at all because he he uh, just makes these crazy plays out of nowhere, and then he'll drop one, an interception, fumble, and you're like, what the hell, Evan? <laughs> you know, you're capable of being so good, and you are good, but just get rid of those annoying little anomaly plays that make no sense. You know, those drops and just whatever it might be. One day, hopefully, he'll fix that problem. Uh, but the, the the Giants have already picked up his fifth year option, so he will be here next year. Um, moving on to the next question uh, from James Chrysler: uh, Do you think the Giants can win out? And I think that it's going to be tough to do that. If they had Daniel Jones and Blake Martinez healthy right now, and the rest of their team was healthy, I think yeah, I I, I could see them winning every game. You know, the Giants match up pretty well against Cleveland, who has a really really good uh, run defense, a run run attack. And the Giants have one of the best run defenses in the NFL, so you know that matches up well. Uh, you know you can confuse Baker Mayfield; he's not the hardest person uh, to confuse out there. He makes boneheaded mistakes all the time, misses throws, um, but then he'll make crazy plays. You know, so the secondary for the Giants has been really good. Luckily, they're healthy. Although you know Darnay Holmes, another guy, he has a knee injury. They're, they're saying he might not even be able to play this week. So if that's the case, expect to see a lot more maybe of Ryan Lewis. Um, and maybe Xavier McKinney. I expect Xavier to get a lot more reps. He had five weeks in, uh, against uh, Cincinnati, and then uh, rather five reps against Cincinnati, and then six reps against Seattle. So he's you know he's edging his way in. He's getting some reps here and there, but you know they're really just easing him into action, uh, mainly because they don't want to mess with the current scheme. You know they don't want to mess with the current starters, which I think is a smart thing to do. Um, so to answer your question, James, I think the Giants could be pretty tough to win out, um, but if they were healthy, I could see it happening. All right, on to Michael Gordon. Even though he probably won't, do you think James Bradbury deserves to be in the conversation for Defensive Player of the Year? Um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of great defenders this year. You know, with Buda Baker, obviously Aaron Donald's at the top of his game. Even Leonard Williams could be in the in the conversation. Um, but Bradbury, you know, he's come on he's come on strong this year. He, he's had a really phenomenal year. He I think he's tied right now with 13 uh, pass breakups. He has a couple interceptions. Um, you know, he, he's locking down guys. DK Metcalf only had about 50 yards on him last week. And, you know, everyone remembers the stiff arm play, but he got him down. He was going for the strip. He, he tries to make plays. He actually forced a fumble last week, too. He's trying to make plays, right? He, he sacrifices his tackling technique to utilize his ball strip technique, which for a cornerback is okay. And you can do that. And, you know, the Giants have been teaching their cornerbacks to do this because it shows up on film. Um, when you watch the corners tackle, they go for the ball. And the reason they go for the ball is because they're so disciplined that they know they have help right behind them. If you watch any of these different plays, these, these fumbles, these turnovers, um, the Giants swarm. They're, they're just all over the place. High intensity, high stamina, swarming to the football. And that's why he can he can take risks. You know, the corners can take risks like that, even if their their uh, tackle miss percentage is, is up. Um, their missed tackle percentage, you know, it's okay because they're going for these big, these big uh, plays and these turnovers, which is, you know, game game changing ones and they've actually won the turnover battle the past couple of weeks so that's a big positive for the giants 
Um, but Bradbury, you know, I don't think he'll win, but I think he'll be in the conversation for sure. Um, all right. Let's see any more. Why does everyone say flip his hips and what does that mean? Um, flipping your hips essentially is like imagine a defensive back, you know, is backpedaling, you know, maybe their maybe their body is parallel to the sideline or they're, uh, you know, they have to flip their hips to the other direction. Um, that way that they can reroute, they can, you know, maybe they're playing zone coverage and they have to flip their hips to, to cover a zone. Um, you know, that's kind of what it is. Just changing direction, the fluidity of your hips. It's a big thing for uh, defensive backs and corners, um, just so, you know, they can, um, you know, get to their assignments quicker. And they, you know, that, that's, that's an important part for them. And I've been learning a lot about the cornerback position, by the way, um, you know, trying to get better for you guys specifically so that we can provide even better content. And one of the things that I learned recently from Brian, you know, our guy over at D-Backs Academy was the motor technique. And I figured I'll share it with you guys just because, you know, uh, it, it's fun to talk about it, you know, as I'm learning about it too. Um, so the motor technique is really cool because it's something that Stefan Gilmore really, really came up with. And the idea is you want to be squared to the wide receiver. It's press. It's only, motor technique is only in motor, it's only in press coverage. So he's right in front of the wide receiver, squared, has his shoulder squared to the guy. Um, and basically, it's it's small, small back steps, a couple inches, about six steps, right? He's taking six steps, but each one's only a couple inches. Um, so it's, it's supposed to allow you to react, right, to what the wide receiver is doing. So it's press coverage. You're not jamming. You're just a couple steps backwards, six steps, and then you turn that into a shuffle. So you react to whatever the wide receiver is doing, you know, take a couple steps backward, uh, six steps specifically, and then you transfer that into a shuffle to then mirror what your wide receiver is doing and then, you know, attack that assignment appropriately. Um, you know, it might be good against guys that are better route runners. Specifically, you know, you might not want to do press coverage against a guy like DK Metcalf because he'll put his head down and he'll run by you. That's why James Barbary played a, a lot of off ball um, this past weekend. But, you know, the motor coverage, pretty really, really cool motor technique. Um, you know, something to think about when you're watching, you know, maybe Stefan Gilmore in the future or some cornerbacks that, you know, might be utilizing this. And, you know, I'll, I'll keep sharing little tidbits with you that I'm learning along the way. Um, another thing that I learned was that the zero technique or really any technique across the offensive line um, for the defensive players. So, you know, you might hear, you know, uh, let's say Dexter Lawrence or Dalvin Tomlinson or Leonard Williams in the zero technique. The zero technique would be directly lined up um, over the center, right, over the nose tackle. Um, that would be the nose tackle position. The one technique would be shade left or shade right of the center, um, you know, and it would continue on that way. Essentially, my question for Brian this past the past couple of days was, uh, you know, can a player who is standing over the over the center be considered a zero technique? You know, that that was my that was my thing. I always thought, you know, maybe it had to be a down lineman that was in the technique. But apparently, um, you know, if let's say it was Carter Coughlin, outside linebacker, he was actually lined up in the zero tech, but he was standing right over the center. Um, so this actually allowed him to do some unique things. You know, he was standing. So what he did was, and this was this is more of Carter Coughlin film that we did in the in the in the YouTube video. It was pretty cool. He actually rushes the the center and then you know just kind of bluffs it for a second and then drops back into spy coverage. So now he's spying on Russell Wilson, keeping his eyes up, and he's following him, making sure if he if he leaves the pocket, he's using that four point five seven uh, forty yard dash speed to get after him. Um, so this is a little bit of stuff uh, I've learned along the way. Hopefully this um, you know helps you guys as you watch the games and learn more, um, you know as we do as well. Um, anyway, this is it for the Fireside Giants episode. Uh, kind of breaking down the injury reports and a couple things that I've been learning. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. And Anthony will be back, of course, from Disneyland. You know, hopefully he won't get too uh, into Star Wars. Turn up his tar Darth Vader next episode. Um, but we'll we'll be back on Saturday and uh, on the Entertainers Channel for the round round table kind of discussion. And on Sunday, of course, we'll do our pregame show. So we'll catch you guys then, and have a good one.